Are you a leader, manager, entrepreneur, business owner, or knowledge worker? Are you leading people or wondering how to be a better leader in your own life and work? If you are, then you can be experimenting better. Welcome to The Experimental Leader, a podcast that takes a look at the ways leaders are experimenting in their own work. Hosted by Melanie Parrish, we dive into real-life conversations about how people might be using a scientist's mindset and experimenting in their work. Shift your leadership into something that works better. Join us on The Experimental Leader today. Today, I'm here with Craig Kilstrom. He is a best-selling author, speaker, and entrepreneur. He's currently the CEO and co-founder at Career Gig after selling his digital experience agency in 2017. He's worked with some of the world's top brands, including AOL, Choice Hotels, Coca-Cola, Dell, FedEx, Geico, Marriott International, MTV, Starbucks, Toyota, and VMware. He currently serves on the University of Richmond's Customer Experience Advisory Board, was the founding chair of the American Advertising Federation's National Innovation Committee, and served on the Virginia Tech Pamplin College of Business Marketing and Mentorship Advisory Board. Greg's newest book, The Center of Experience, talks about how customer and employee experience can be operationalized into a cohesive brand experience. His podcast, The Agile World, launched in 2019 and discusses brand strategy, marketing, and customer experience. He is a regular contributing writer to Forbes and has been featured in publications such as Smart CEO, The Washington Post, and Advertising Age. Craig, I'm so excited to have you on my show today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, I have so many questions. You're up to all sorts of interesting things. Tell me a little bit about what you are up to in your work right now. Sure. Yeah. So I am the CEO of Career Gig, and so Career Gig is a platform that connects freelancers and uh, with companies who hire them, as well as with benefits like health and, and retirement. So we just launched uh, Career Gig. Uh, we're about six weeks ago now. So we are in uh, active growth mode and and all kinds of fun stuff going on. And then you know within the last year, I published my most recent book called The Center of Experience. And so that deals with topics of customer experience and employee experience. And then I've got a podcast of my own uh, called The Agile World, and I've been working on that as well. Well, I'm fascinated. I actually, in my book, I, I actually put the Agile Manifesto in because I think it's so relevant to my book. But I'm curious about what Agile has to do with the work you do. What's important about that? Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, as, as you well know, I think Agile can be interpreted very strictly by, you know, you can be a certified scrum master and adhere to the Agile methodology and all that. And I think that's a great process and yields great results. I'm not a scrum master and I, I would say I apply Agile in a, in a broader sense of the term, but I think it's an important one. So, you know, the first book that I wrote on the topic was talking about web design and development and just applying more agile principles to it. Then I wrote a book about branding and so applying more agile principles to branding and marketing. And then I wrote one called The Agile Consumer, which takes that, that branding and communications aspect a little bit further. To me, I think the important thing with agile is, and there's, there's some misconceptions about it too. I think a lot of people hear the term agile and they think, reactive or you know we're changing things too often or things like that and and to me the reason why there's an agile methodology is that people take the time to yes it's on a shorter increment so you know you're taking whether it's like two week sprints or or something like that you're taking time you're building something you're measuring you're evaluating it and then you're iterating and optimizing you're not simply just agility is not simply being reactive to, oh my God, the numbers are bad from yesterday. Let's scrap everything and start over. It's actually forcing you to be methodical on a shorter time frame than some may have been used to, but it's forcing you to be scientific and methodical about how you make improvements to your, whether it's your company, whether it's your marketing software, whatever you might apply to it. That's really interesting. And I'm creating online courses right now. So I'm launching my first funnels and things like that. And 
Agile has never been more alive in my coaching practice than it is right now. So it's it's quite topical that yeah. we're chatting. Yeah, it's great. So tell me, let's go back to career gig for a minute. There's some gap in the marketplace that you thought career gig would fill. Tell me about that. This seems like a grand experiment in and of itself. <laughs> so yeah, I think there's a niche that we fill that's that's really interesting. And so, you know, we're a, we're a marketplace that connects freelancers and companies. So we have two sets of customers. I will say as a marketer, that's more challenging than having one set of customers, but it also brings opportunity with it. So on the freelancer side, what we offer that other platforms don't is not only we offer great, great opportunities to so project work, hourly work, things like that. But we also offer health, retirement, and other benefits to freelancers that work on the platform. So if you've worked a salary job your whole life, you don't have a full appreciation for the fact that we offer guaranteed issue insurance, um, not only health insurance, but life, disability, other things like that. If you try to get those as an individual and you have pre-existing conditions or other, you know, other mitigating factors, it's really, really hard to get, not only get them at all, but it's, it's hard to get a good rate on them. And so, you know, the Affordable Care Act or otherwise known as Obamacare definitely helps in the health insurance space. But there's, you know, depending on where you live and some other factors, that can be a bit of a challenge as well. And so, you know, we saw a need of not just um, mechanically getting people insurance and, and benefits, but how do we take care of a freelancer so that they can actually have the flexibility of being independent, being able to work when they want, as much or as little as they want, have the flexibility to work remotely if they want, for whatever reasons, whether it's taking care of children, a spouse or partner that either doesn't work or can't work, parents, all manner of things, or just wants the freedom to be able to work when and where they want. But making sure that those people also have access to the that safety net, the you know, the benefits that that a lot of people take full-time jobs just to get those those things that really keep them able to you know to to weather uh, any storm, so to speak. And then on the company side of things, we see a big niche where you know there's low-cost platforms where you can hire somebody to design a logo for fifty bucks, and the quality is is necessary, but it doesn't really matter who's doing it, where they're doing it from, so on and so forth. And then you know on the other end of the spectrum. They're staffing companies that, you know, they're good at what they do, but they're slow. They charge 30% of a, a placement, you know, a salary and all that. And they're not really, they're not really geared towards high-end professionals that want to be freelance and independent, who want, again, that safety net, but also, you know, are looking for interesting work and highly skilled work. And, and that's where we've kind of netted out. Interesting. Six weeks in, you're probably collecting some interesting data about what's working and what's not. What are you learning? We'll be back right after this message. I hope that you're enjoying my show. And if you'd like to take a look at my book, The Experimental Leader, Be a New Kind of Boss to Cultivate an Organization of Innovators, I have a special deal for my podcast listeners. Go to book.experimentalleader.com and you can get a digital copy of my book for just $4.95. I hope you love it as much as I loved writing it. And I hope it helps you create your first experiments. Welcome back to the show. Yeah, I mean, I think the, particularly given the, the economic climate that we're in right now, you know, I think that we're seeing if we can provide great work opportunities, then freelancers are more than willing to sign up. I mean, it's, you know, it's free to sign up our platform. We don't actually don't even charge subscription fees. We charge a cut of transactions. So the more you use our platform, the less those transaction fees become even. So, you know, we reward people that, that use it frequently. But, you know, what we're seeing is, yeah, you know, it's really, we're trying to focus on bringing the best possible opportunities from, you know, from great companies. And then, you know, that's really going to drive the growth with freelancers. And, you know, we are seeing companies are really struggling right now with what to do. You know, do they hire W-2, like full-time salaried employees back only to potentially have to lay them off or furlough them again? Or are they going to build a more flexible and stable workforce that, you know, just happens to be hourly or freelance workers? And I think more and more are opting for the latter because it just gives them the flexibility and to be able to really face whatever might be coming down the road. What's your dream for this company? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I would love to be the premier provider of freelance opportunities for a, a skilled workplace. And I think that's, and you know, the go-to choice for enterprises and large companies to be able to hire from. And I think all the while doing something good in the sense of providing for not just providing money for the freelancers, but providing for the rest of their life, providing stability and, and security that they just, they wouldn't get otherwise. And that in many times they're selling themselves short, you know, just to get a full-time job just so they can get them. And I think, you know, if we can do that, I think we improve people's quality of life. And that's important. Mm, very interesting. It sounds like you're pretty clear on the value of providing stability in people's work lives. Yeah, I think it's so important. And I think, again, it's something that is often overlooked. I mean, it's, you know, it, the cost of living is so expensive. And, you know, people are just they're taking on jobs on top of jobs. I mean, 36% of the U.S. workforce engaged pre-COVID engaged in some kind of freelance or gig work. And that could be some people that were also at a full-time job. But that was already earlier this year, that was already projected to be 50% of the workforce by 2027. The numbers that we're seeing, I mean, already the IRS is expecting a way more people to be filing as 1099s this year than they ever were expecting. And I would imagine this has only accelerated that. I mean, I, you know, having lived through the 2009 financial crisis, you know, I had my marketing agency back then. And, you know, we saw, uh, we were fortunate enough to actually grow that year, but we saw a lot of competition fall by the wayside. And I believe that crisis really is what created the gig economy as we know it. I mean, you know, Uber, Lyft, all of those companies, they got started either around that time or within, you know, within a year or two of 2009. And so, you know, everybody's been kind of feeling like this, this idea of the stable full-time job is, I don't know that it ex has existed during my career, but it sure doesn't exist now. Well, I've been working at home self-employed for 20 years, so <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, I'm with you on, on all of these things. And I, I am diversified with you know, great health insurance and things only because because of my spouse. Yeah. So it is interesting. And I, and I really hear the need for what you're talking about. Let's shift gears just a little bit. Like you write books, you have a podcast, you are by all measures, probably a very busy person. What do you do to care for yourself? How do you take care of your own self care? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And there's a lot of things that I'm interested in. I mean, I so I one of the reasons I write so much is actually it helps me to learn about either new things or just kind of dive deeper on on things that I may only have scratched the surface on. So, you know, in a, in a way that's that's caring for my desire to learn, but I think, you know, from looking at it in a different way, I do take care of I have a routine in the morning for instance to take care of myself. So, you know, I don't check email when I'm, you know, when I wake up, I do not reach for my phone and check my email. Like I have a, you know, I'm CEO of a company. If somebody really needs to get a hold of me, I told them like just, you know, send me a text and we'll deal with an emergency, but otherwise I spend I go for a walk every morning. I just take I exercise, I take care of myself and then I'm centered and I actually have had time to think about what's actually the priority for the day, not just, you know, oftentimes what's sitting at the top of your inbox is not the biggest priority. It's just what happens to be sitting at, at the top of your inbox. And so, you know, by taking an hour or two in the morning to, you know, I get up early, you know, just to account for it. But by taking a little bit of time to do that, then, you know, the rest of my day, I can really be focused and I can devote it to work and I can dev and really be there when I need to be because I've taken that, that bit of time for myself. Interesting. I love that you're talking about, you know, sort of the structures that you use to do it on a regular basis. What keeps you up at night? Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess it depends on the, the different eras of my career. But I mean, I think, you know, right now, as well as even, you know, I, my marketing agency, I sold it about three years ago. I think the thing that I always am pushing myself is you know, can we be doing something either better or are we still differentiated from those, you know, those that we're competing against? And I, you know, I don't, fingers crossed or whatever, we don't have direct competitors in everything that we do, but we have plenty, there's plenty of competition in our general area. And certainly owning a marketing agency, same thing. It's like, I, I thought we did a great work, but there's a million marketing agencies 
in the world. And so, you know, what I'm always struggling with is, again, can we do something better and more efficiently so that just either the people doing the work are happier and able to focus more on what they value more or, you know, are we staying a, a step ahead of, of the competition? And then maybe, you know, to add a third thing there is what we're doing the right thing. I mean, I don't even know who said this, but a quote that I often go to is, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And, you know, I, I, that's gotten me out of a lot of trouble in my life probably is, you know, there's, I have so many talented people on my team. I've been surrounded by talented people my entire career, but, you know, just having good ideas isn't enough. It's really like, are we solving the right problems? And maybe that's the biggest thing that, that, that I think about. Mm, Thanks for that. I know that's kind of a, a deep dive into what's going on inside your mind. I've also been thinking about imposter syndrome a fair bit lately, and it doesn't have to be super personal. I'm not asking you to tell us all your secrets, but I am curious. I know people grapple with imposter syndrome. I know it comes up for me sometimes, but I'm curious what you could say about it and when it might come up for you and what you do about it. Yeah. And I might need a better definition of of the term, but I mean, based on my understanding, I mean, I think, you know, being in startup world as, as I am and having started a company before a couple other companies in my career, I think there's always the tendency to, you know, we hear fake it till you make it. And so therefore that entire premise is based on essentially you're an imposter (laughs) and pretending to be something that you're not and that that's the right approach. And, you know, I'll say I, there's been, I've been guilty of this in sales meetings of selling things that I didn't quite know how we're going to be delivered. But, you know, I think the, I think the challenge becomes there's got to be some authenticity and some validity to what you're doing. I also think I might categorize myself as an overachiever. And I think, you know, sometimes people that do a lot and, and are very driving of themselves have a lot of like self motivation often sell themselves short on what they have done. And, you know, so sometimes I, I'm reminded by others that, you know, yes, it's not, you know, this and this are not true, but, you know, look at all these other things. And I'm just like, man, but that was like yesterday. What have I done today? And so I don't know if that answers your question, but it's sort you know, it, it is something to, you know, we've all got to live with and we kind of see that we see this played out on TV and on social media. And so I think it's a problem that probably is going to get worse with younger generations even. I think it's pretty ubiquitous among leaders that we all suffer from it occasionally. I find it's often, you know, when I'm trying to stretch a little bigger than I was before, do something I haven't done before. And so I think you're right that as entrepreneurs, we learn how to fake it till we make it. And I just think it's so fascinating to hear how people think about it. So thanks for your thoughts on that. Sure, sure. Tell me a little bit about your podcast. Who should listen to your podcast? Yeah, sure. So it's called The Agile World. And what I've tried to do is what I've talked about in my books is, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, thinking about agile in a broader sense of the term. And, you know, I actually have had some real like strict agile people on it that, you know, that have applied agile in, you know, anything from Fortune 100 companies to small organizations or consultants. But more often, I have people that, uh, you know, the lens that I look at everything through is, is agility. And so, you know, I've had uh, recently like a doctor that started a telemedicine practice because just the, I mean, with coronavirus, like there's just the mechanics of getting to a doctor's office was impossible for his patients. I've had, you know, a global CHRO of a Fortune 50 company talking about, you know, how organizational culture is impacted in an international organization. I've had, you know, so everybody just kind of looking at that, but the common thread is being adaptive or, and uh, adaptable to change. And, you know, whether that's, you know, we're living in a great and terrible social experiment right now with coronavirus, but the world was always changing and it's, you know, it will continue to change even if, if some things settle down. And so that's, you know, that, that's what I like to look at is just how do people find ways to adapt and thrive, you know, in whatever their industry might be. That's amazing. That's so near and dear to my heart as the with the experimental leader and all that that I love to talk about with how people do that. So it's very aligned. Where can people find you? Yeah. So, um, you know, for I have to plug career gig and, you know, go to you can sign up for free at at careergig.com. But if you want to connect with me personally, um, I'm very active on LinkedIn. I would just say, you know, let me know that you heard me on this podcast. And, you know, I'd be more than happy to 
connect with you and you know message and, and all that kind of stuff. Always looking for great connections. That's great. Thank you so much for being on the show today. It's been such a pleasure to have you. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. This is Melanie Parrish, and I've been talking to Greg Kilstrom about his company, Career Gig. And I am so fascinated by his entrepreneurial spirit. I love how he's looking for how to provide value in the marketplace and how he refers to having two clients. It's so clear that his mission is aligned with having a vision for people feeling secure in their work and having people have stability. It's so interesting how he weaves the idea of agile throughout his brand and everything ties back to the concept of agile and how we can be more flexible and more intentional about short sprints and how we do things differently based on that principle. It's been a pleasure speaking with Greg today. Go experiment. Thank you for joining us on another episode of The Experimental Leader. We hope you have found value in today's episode because we're dedicated to helping you become the experimental leader you want to be. To access the show notes or learn more about working with Melanie, visit melanieparish.com. Go experiment. <laughs>